Well, good morning. Well, you all settled down real quiet, real quick. I'm not used to that. Now I don't know what to say. It's good to see you guys all here today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. That above all, he thought of us, above himself. That he stepped down into the earth for us to murder so that we might be saved. Lord, we are blessed among people because of you. Lord, this morning we come and pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds that as we look at your word that we might be inspired, might be spurred on to live for you. Help us today, Lord, as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're back in the book of Genesis, chapter 6. We're going to finish the last... Uh, nine verses, at least I really hope we do. You know, I try, but sometimes I fail. We've been looking at Noah and the flood, and last week we saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every thought and the intention of his heart was only evil continually. And God mourned the fact that he had made man, that he was sorry, that he was grieved in his heart, that he had made human beings. Boy, what if you're a parent and has a wayward child, you know what that feels like. Except this is the whole world and all of God's creation having gone that way. We talked about the Nephilim. We spoke about those who came down and fell from their place and left their abode and cohabitated and with human beings and created a super race. And we talked about that last week. There could have been billions of people on the earth at this point in time looking at the long life and the fertility of all of the people in the pre-flood era. And so we talked about this unnatural mixing and producing children of mixed heritage. And the, the problem is that God says that we should stay according to our kind, as we see in the scriptures. We see this referred to in both 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and also the book of Jude, about angels who left their abode in heaven. And they took wives, human wives, and how they mixed. We discussed all that last week. Then God gives us a deadline. He says, I'm not going to strive with man forever because the, the days will be 120 years. So he's giving a timeline of the next 120 years. Noah's got to build a boat. It's called an ark. And I, I wonder if anybody ever heard of an ark before the ark was built. And by the way, the Ark of the Covenant is a completely different word, so don't worry. It, it, it's not confusing if you read it in another language. But in English, it tends to get you mixed up. But then Ark, it's basically a box. And so he's got to build a box to, to get out of Dodge. The cool thing is there's no motor. There's no steering wheel. There's no control. It's a barge. It's got to be towed along. And uh, thank God that the Lord's in control of our barge. Amen because sometimes uh, our steering is off. Talked about the Nephilim, these ones who fell, uh, the fallen ones, how they came and um, there were giants on the earth and we see them coming back later, even as the scripture says that they also came back later, these giants. And we see uh, Goliath and his four brothers and we see the descendants of Anak, the Anakim, who are told to be completely wiped out, uh, you know, men, women, children, everybody, and of course, reading that without understanding uh, the genetic contamination, you say, well, that just seems like God is so very cruel. But there are, there are children of mixed descent who will ruin the bloodline so that the Messiah will not be able to come. And so God is ultimately protecting us. And that's part of the reason why the flood comes, is so that it will be saved. We talked about how God was distressed and he grieved in his heart and how we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God by our own lifestyle and the things that we choose to do. We talked about that. And God was sorry that he had made man. It's not like 
he didn't see this coming or he didn't know it was happened, but he was grieved in his heart about it. It doesn't mean that God made a mistake by making human beings. Uh, the old King James says that God repented that he had made man, and that kind of leans us in the direction like God made a sin by making people, but that's not the way that the word is intended in the original. So God is grieved, and of course we don't want to grieve the Spirit of God who was given to us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, the scripture says. We talked about how Noah was perfect in the eyes of the Lord, and, and perfect is kind of a strong word. We use it in the, in the realm of perfectionism. In other words, there's not a flaw. It's absolutely flawless, like a flawless diamond. Um, but it means that he was perfect in his genetics. He wasn't mixed up with all of this inbreeding, this mixed breeding that was going on. He was completely uh, free of all that, and so that's why he was preserved. And also he was a righteous man like Enoch, who walked with God and then he was no more because God had taken him. So we see Enoch missing the flood and he's actually taken out of the way until judgment comes, a picture of the rapture as we talked about last week. And how he walked with God and he was perfect in his generations. And then of course, we're announced that Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and that the world was full of violence. Uh, you know what it's like to raise kids in a society that's messed up? Imagine trying to raise kids in this society and have your dad's got a giant boat in the driveway telling everybody it's going to rain and they're all going to drown. You want to talk about being excluded. <laughs> Their dad is that guy that's preaching on a corner saying everybody's going to die, building a big boat in the middle of nowhere without a truck or a trailer. He says he's building an ark. What's an ark? He says it's going to rain. What's rain? Can you imagine how bizarre it looked then? But you know, when you start to look around and you look at the violence that's happening, and you guys know that today is 9-11. It's the anniversary of the, the towers being taken out. And who would have known that you could use planes for a, a weapon? And we talked about this the violence that's coming up, and people get violent over the silliest little things. Road rage is like a thing. Shootings in schools are a thing. Who would have thought? So our world, we see increasingly, violence is becoming more prevalent. So this week, we're gonna go over just those nine verses. Verse 14, chapter six. God says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits and the width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark on its side so that you may make it with lower second and third decks. So we're given the architecture of this massive boat. And of course, we don't have tape measures that have cubits on it. Um, cubit is pretty much 18 inches. It's the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger. I measured mine. It's exactly 18 inches. I mean, to the centimeter. I'm mixing imperial and centimeters. There's, there are several discussions as to how long, a, cent, uh, how long a, a cubit is. Some people believe that it's up to even 25 inches, like an Egyptian um, measure or a Babylonian measure, which is 24. But pretty much it's 18. Some of them are a little bit smaller. It all depends on whose arm you have. <laughs> Carl's arm is probably more the Egyptian scale. <laughs> Mine is more 18. So I'm going with 18. 18 cubits. Uh, so this is a massive structure. First of all, we know that it's built out of gopher wood. And if you have a gopher wood tree hanging around, it's a very resiny tree. And from what they can understand, it's probably an evergreen like the cypress or a cedar. So this is an evergreen tree, which is very easily bent and put into position. And it's very resiny. So it has a lot of uh, resin in it. So it resists becoming waterlogged, at least until it is kiln dried and it dries out like what we do with it. So that's what gopher wood is. 
And they're told to put pitch on the outside, which is a rather interesting thing. And you guys may know it as tar. If you've done any roofing, you know what a terrible thing it is to get it all over your clothes. And you just got to burn them, you know, throw them away, shoes, everything. Uh, if you get it on your skin, it's really hard to get out and you have to use things to, to kind of basically scrape it off your skin. That sort of pitch. It's rather interesting because many of the other interpretations of this word, word which was kafar, is atonement. And I find it rather interesting that it's here alone in the scripture that it's defined as pitch and everywhere else it's atonement. I think that's interesting and I think the Holy Spirit is pointing to Christ that this ark is a picture of what it is to be in Christ and what salvation is all about. But they have it pitched on the outside. And of course, that's a great thing if you want the boat to float and not to take on water. But he says, pitch it on the inside as well. Why would you pitch the inside? It's like putting a roof inside the boat. Because I think God wants to preserve it. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit later about the remnants of the, the boat. You guys know that the ark is up on Ararat. It's in Turkey. They actually have remnants of it. There have been at least 20 explorers who have gone there and brought back samples and taken pictures. And actually, there's one recently just took a movie of it. So it's really there. And it's way up high on Ararat. It's uh, like 14,000 feet. When the, sun, when the sun melts some of that snow away, you can actually get to it but it's a really treacherous area. But anyway, I digress. Pitch on the inside and out, meaning it will be preserved. It's got three decks, an upper, middle, and a lower deck. And there's going to be a window. Now, you might think of a window as just being a square little thing, but it's, it's probably a cubit, which is 18 inches all the way around. And what that does is it allows sunlight to come in. It allows all the noxious fumes from all those animals to escape. It, it also allows daylight so you can see what's going on. So we're talking a structure that's 450 feet long. You guys know how big a football field is? That's it's 100 yards or 300 feet. So this boat is bigger than a football field. It's a massive structure. How many of you have been to see the Ark in Kentucky? Three or two of you. Wow, you really should get there. Or pull it up online. Actually, this, that's a picture of it right here. It's an actual two-scale boat that's been built, and it's fantastic and full of information. That plus the Creation Museum are a great uh, two days, at least, of walking around. Just to give you an idea and say, well, you know, there are a lot of people say there's no way that this boat could have fit all the animals that were in there. Well, this will hold 125,000 sheep, just to give you an idea how big it is. And most of the animals are smaller than a sheep, the mean size of an animal from the smallest to the largest. We have some very large animals. But if you take the mean size, it's actually smaller than a sheep. And we only have 18,000 species. So it's very easily done. It can displace 24,000 tons of water for it to sit into the water uh, 15 cubits in, which is where you want it to, to be keeled at uh, so that it has stability. In fact, the structure of this is built so well that there are ships that we still build, like battleships and so forth, that have the same dimensions roughly, width to length to height because it's such a stable size. How did God know? It'll hold 1.4 million square feet or 522 rail cars worth of stuff. That's food, animals, and human beings. And only having 18,000 species. And uh, hopefully the Lord was really cool and brought young ones. They take up less room. Although they have to be walked more often. Verse 17, and behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which has the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant, that's a promise, a commitment, with you. 
and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing and of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and every creeping thing in the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you, and you'll keep them alive. You shall take for yourself of all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it for yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. So Noah is given the job of being a zoologist suddenly. He now has to gather all of these animals, and he's got to store up food for all of these animals. Um, it's quite a project. And you can imagine God brought these animals. Noah didn't have to go out and find them with a lasso and, uh, you know, go on a, on a wonderful hunt. We're going to look for these animals on the outback. You know, they came to him, which is an amazing thing, how God caused it to happen. And uh, I can just imagine the parade of animals that were coming in. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. It's such a small little verse, and yet this is a big deal. For God to speak to anybody to do this job is a big deal. I want you to build this gigantic, massive structure. We're going to call it an ark. And uh, don't worry about the steering wheel or the rudder. I'll take care of that. And he tells him exactly how to build it. Tells him exactly the size and every dimension. And he was obedient. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah not just heard what God said, but he actually did what God said. Probably my biggest struggle is doing everything that I know God would have me do. How about you? Yeah. And it was said of Noah that he did everything that God commanded him to do. That's a tremendous, tremendous comment. Boy, I, I wish that could be on my tombstone, but it can't. <laughs> it could have him, though. In 2 Peter 2, 5, it says, And he did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. The Lord brought the flood as a judgment, and he preserved only eight people. Whenever you see numbers in the Bible, I'm of the opinion that every single word, number, location, name is significant because it's God's word and it's breathed by him. Interesting, eight, whenever you see eight, it's always the number of new beginnings, right? Like you have a scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you have seven, and then eight is the new beginning, just like on a piano. It's like a week, you have seven days and then you have a new beginning. So you'll find throughout the scripture, eight is the number of new beginnings. So, <laughs> this is a nice short service for you today, but that's not all. <laughs> We're going to jump right into chapter seven. So brace yourself. And then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal. Seven, not two. A male and his female, two of each animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. How many of you only thought that there was two of each animal? Only two. Sunday school people, yeah. There's two of the unclean animals, and then there are seven each. In other words, a total of 14, because you can't have seven doesn't pair well, does it? 14 animals. Why do I have 14 of the same kind of animal? Anyway, and so the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. 
It's funny because Jesus says the same thing. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does Noah's name mean? Isn't that interesting? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I have a whole list of how the ark of Noah and how Noah are a picture of who Jesus is to come. And that's the huge point about the ark. And the Lord said, come. And of course, they all have to go through the one door that's in the side of the ark, right? And I think about Revelation 4. It says, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and there was one who sat on the throne. Just as God called Noah to come into the ark, he called John in the book of Revelation to come up and to see the things that he revealed which are written in the book of Revelation. It's interesting how Jesus says, come unto me all you who are weary and you will find Noah. I think it's rather interesting how the entire scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, and the book of Revelation all have ties together. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus says, I am the door. I don't think it's an accident that these things are said. So how was it that Noah was righteous? When, when I read this, I ask questions of the text. What, what is it about Noah that he was righteous? Well, he did what God told him to do. That's what makes Noah righteous. Noah's got a big grin on his face because he thinks I'm talking about him. <laughs> we got another Noah over here too, so. Got a couple of Noahs. What made him righteous is he was obedient. He did what God said. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's evidence that you have a relationship with God that you can even do that. But if only Noah was righteous, why was his family saved? I mean, because you're a Christian, does that immediately mean that your family will be saved? No. So why was it that Noah was found righteous and his family benefited from all that? That's because he's the picture of Jesus Christ, isn't he? How is it that we get saved? Isn't it through a representative who was righteous? Amen. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, wait, why seven of each of some animals? Why seven? I, that was a surprise for some of you, right? Yeah. You don't know it now, but the first thing that Noah does once he disembarks is he makes sacrifice to God. Yeah. And he knows exactly which animals to sacrifice. He knows which are acceptable and which are unacceptable. Also, there was a barbecue. <laughs> so how did he know what a clean animal was? We don't have the Mosaic law until generations later. They knew about blood sacrifice because of Adam and Eve. They knew what an acceptable sacrifice was because of Cain and Abel. They've known, and it's been handed down all of this time because God told them. And so the animals all come two by two or seven by seven. I wonder how, you know, they approved who's coming on. Can I see your ID, please? One of the interesting thing was if, if you, uh, scientists have taken the, genetics of a wolf and examined it and every single breed is inside the genetics of a wolf. So inside a wolf you get all kinds of dogs that come from one species. It's a rather interesting thing. So you don't have to have two beagles, two golden retrievers, two, you just have two wolves. It's a rather interesting thing. You ever wonder how they could figure out where you were from when they do, you know, the genetics? They do the genetic testing and they say, oh, well, you're, you're from this part of the world and that part of the world. You know how they do that? They check your genetics and they trace it. And you know what? They found out that there are two 
original genetic mother and father. They hate to admit it, but Adam and Eve are looking very scientific. So, interesting things as we go by. Maybe it was a cat that was on duty. They're always, uh, always up for, you know. I'm not a fan of cats. Anyway, for after seven more days, it will cause the rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Notice it's only raining for 40 days and 40 nights. They end up being inside of this thing for 377 days. 17 days more than a year. Isn't that something? And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flo floodwaters were on the earth. And so Noah with his sons, his wife, his son's wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God has commanded Noah. So they're all marching and heading towards this place, and he's probably got them out in the field until they get to the ark, until they have to go. Of course, the Lord told him, you got seven days, you got one week. So I'm sure he checked his wrist sundial and <laughs> said, okay, got to keep an eye on that. 40, 40 days and 40 nights. There again, the number 40 is the number of testing, the number of trial. You remember Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. You remember Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You remember Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You remember the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 is the number of testing, of trial. And that's probably more like the cat that would be uh, <laughs> checking IDs. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Noticed, water comes from two directions. It comes from above, where the canopy, which God created probably around the earth, it just unzipped and suddenly it rained. You guys think, you know what rain looks like. You know, we get a, we get a couple of days and we get a, a bad nor'easter. Or, you know, we get, we get a, a storm that blows in and a lot of places around here are underwater. Imagine the entire world flooding and the sky just busting loose and dropping its canopy upon you. But it also says that the ground opened up and that water came from the deep as well. So it wasn't just from above, it was from underneath. It's a rather strange thing that God did. I'm going to give you a proposal. I guess you guys know that there's this concept of Pangea, that everything was one land mass at one point in time, and all of the, the land pieces seemed to be a jigsaw puzzle that would fit together quite nicely. It may be that this is a time in which God tore those open, because in between what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, in between continents, there are mountain ranges underneath. And then on either side of those mountain ranges are deep, deep trenches, as though they were torn open on purpose. So it may have been one of these times that God used to tear open the Pangea, the one landmass, and cause this to happen. And it's a rather interesting phenomenon and there's evidence of world flooding everywhere. In fact, there's at least a dozen other cultures that have similar stories to Noah. And a lot of them have the same details. Some of them have a raven and a dove. Some of them are, are crazy and the story goes off because, you know, it's like telephone. You know, you give it to somebody and it just becomes bigger and bigger. But this is the true deal of really what happened and how God brought a flood on the earth. And some of the mountains that are actually underneath the ocean, have established cities on them. None of you are amazed. 
And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark of Noah two by two, all the flesh which had the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and were greatly increased on the earth. The ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. It's interesting it would say 15 cubits because if you have something 30 cubits high and it begins to float, it floats usually about 15 cubits into the keel. And so he says, the water rose to such a point and there we go. I want you to notice that the Lord shut the door. I think that's incredibly significant. The Lord shut the door. There's none of us who are going to determine such things and judgment on people, but God does. And there's a time in which he'll shut the door. There's a limited time that people have to act. And he gives warnings all along. And Noah was lifted up. It's interesting that Noah was lifted up and he was preserved. I think it's another picture of how God takes out of the way those who are righteous and those whom he chooses, and he brings judgment on those who have earned it. I believe that's what he's going to do for the church of God as well, because I believe too that we will be lifted up before God's judgment. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 17, 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man, which is rather curious, because if you look into the book of Daniel, you know he sees this wonderful vision of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and there's this head of gold and the torso of silver, and then he's got bronze, and, and he's got the two legs that are kind of bronze into clay, mingled with clay. And every one of those materials in that section of that idol were nations. And each one of those nations, starting with Nebuchadnezzar as the head, all the way down to the Romans, and then the second Roman Empire, it's mingled with clay. And it's interesting, in the book of Daniel, it tells you what the clay is. I'm going to leave that as a little mystery for Sean. That's a little tidbit for Sean. Why Sean? Why not Sean? <laughs> and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of spirit of life and all that all that was on dry land died. And so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. And they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So you've got rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and then you have 150 days of water just tossing you back and forth, moving you around. It's interesting because if you look at the fossil record, there are woolly mammoths that they find that are frozen in mid-chew. Now, how in the world does that happen? They were able to examine these woolly mammoths because they actually drowned they suffocated, and you're able to see what they ate. The amazing thing is they're finding them in Antarctica, and they're finding tropical vegetation in their mouth. How does a woolly mammoth in Antarctica 
get tropical vegetation in its mouth unless there was a canopy and the earth was of a uniform temperature and unless there was a flood instantly that came it takes something like that to happen and of course they try to propose that there's all sorts of other reasons for this why is it that they only find fossils in one layer it's because if you have a giant flood and everything dies and all the bones stack up and then it gets covered up with sediment, it gets preserved. You, you go into any graveyard and start digging up bodies, you're not going to find preserved fossils. You're going to find everyone degraded. So why is it that we find only this particular layer, everything preserved? Because there was a worldwide flood and everything on earth died. And because on top of it, was sediment from all of the waters rushing around, they were preserved. It's a very simple explanation. It doesn't take a lot of faith. It just takes an understanding. I want you to know that there was one ark. There was only one ark. God didn't have, you know, like buses coming, picking people up. Hey, it's raining. You got to get out of here. An evacuation thing going on. There was one ark, one shot. One opportunity. Do you know people in this world only have one shot, one opportunity? The ark is like Jesus Christ, and those who go into it are safe. Matthew seven thirteen to 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it, just like eight souls in all were the ones who were delivered in the time of Noah. Few there will be who find Jesus Christ as their Savior to be delivered. I want you to notice that God shut the door. He determined the timing of it. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Notice they're hung up on performance. Notice that all of these things were done in the name of Jesus, but the person possessing the name didn't know him. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Do you know that that is the bottom line to what Christ wants is a relationship with people. He doesn't want you to do a bunch of stuff. He could get anybody to do anything, but he doesn't. He wants to know you. And he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which is evidence that they don't belong to the Father. But God shuts the door, and there's a limited time. Everyone has a limited time. We all has it, have an expiration date. I want you to notice that everyone who got on the boat lived. By the way, there's no recorded deaths of any of the animals. There's no recorded deaths of Noah's sons or his daughters or anyone else. I just think that's a, that's a tremendous thing, going through a tragedy like that and no one dying. In Romans 10, 9 to 11, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, like Noah and his family. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Can you imagine Noah saying, ah, that's a crazy thought. But he didn't show him a vision, he spoke to him directly. Imagine he decided, come on, I can't do that. That's too hard. You're asking a lot of me. I mean, I, gotta, I, I don't know how to do this stuff. You ever say such things? I can't go tell them about Jesus. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to think I'm a whack job. You might be surprised. 
At this point, all theological theories were done. The flood came and everyone died. I want you to notice three categories of people. There were those who died in the flood. There were those who lived through the flood. And there were those who were delivered before the flood. One man, his name is Enoch. You're also very quiet today. Enoch was removed before the judgment of the flood. And not only that, there are those others who would be delivered as well. It says in Revelation 3, verses 7 to 10, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Isn't that interesting? Just like the door on the boat. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. A trial that comes upon the whole world, I believe he's referring to the great tribulation. And you will be preserved if you hold fast to Christ Jesus. Philadelphia isn't just a place, not just a city in the US, but it's a type of people who love God. And now, that's it. I think I'll do, and you're still moaning. I can't believe that. I've... The word of God is so incredibly rich and deep, and there are things I didn't even talk about. When we come back next week and we look at chapter eight, we're going to see all sorts of marvelous things in the word. The exact date when the ark sets down is given to the day of when the door is opened. I wonder if you did a little bit of research, if you'd be able to understand what day that was. That's right, if you don't know, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> I'd like to ask the worship team to come up at this time. And I wanna encourage you, if, if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, like Noah and his boys and their wives have done, you can and should do that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And anyone who comes to him will be saved.